I am used to that. Used to being discriminated against. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm fine. I do believe that that's the last <coughs> coming. It's actually nice if you can see the uh, passage over there, people coming up. So, the word of the Buddha. And uh, for this afternoon, the right stillness otherwise known as China. And of course, <coughs> of course you know that for such a long time that uh, I really did not like the term um, concentration. And so, change it to stillness is much, much, much better. The history of this was Rice Davids, a great uh, scholar, but he had to sort of get some sort of rendering, so he used concentration and for those who have experienced one of these uh, states the concentration is just too forceful, you have to hold it whatever you hold after a while it just breaks and it's not a restful place and of course, oh, excuse me Bear, but I'd find another place to sit but that's the um, simile which I, I gave in the very first day how can you get a glass of water to be still? You can never hold it still. You put it down, let it go, and it becomes still all by itself. It's a simple uh, idea, but that's how the mind becomes still. You let it be, leave it alone, stop struggling, disengage, stop grasping. And then the water becomes perfectly still. And that's the insight based on that stillness. <coughs> when I was uh, in Hong Kong recently, that, not so Hong Kong, in Korea, that um, there was a, another monk making this uh, uh, presentation about uh, meditation mindfulness from the Jogji order. And uh, he said this story, and now I've been using this story as well for a long time. And that was the, if you go up into the mountains, especially in the evening on a full moon night, and if you find a lake, if that lake is perfectly still, there's not even a ripple on the surface, only then do you get an accurate, perfect reflection of the full moon and the stars in the heaven above. If there's a ripple, on that lake, 
this distortion. You can't see a, a really accurate reflection. In the same way, if there's a ripple in the mind, it's not still, then of course you never see a very accurate reflection of the Dharma, of the truth. But when your mind is perfectly still, just like a lake in the mountains on a windless evening, then you see this beautiful, perfect image of the moon and the stars. So that's why we have the simile of sti <coughs> stillness. And even just stillness by itself is just a very, very wonderful thing to experience. When nothing moves, when everything is resting, when there's no disturbance at all, nothing to fix, nothing to do, perfectly still. That's why I translated it as, uh, as stillness. And of course, lo and behold, these uh, teachings, many of them were taken over in the very early years to China and were translated into Chinese. And the Chinese translations, because of the nature of the pict pictograph, they do have like one character per word. So it is almost like a word-by-word -word translation in the um, Chinese, they're called argamas, argamas like tradition. And so the, many of the Chinese versions of the suttas, which we have in Pali, they've actually come from a very, very early time. So it's a good way to actually to trace, you know, what these words mean and how they were understood, you know, by you know, the Chinese translators, uh, sometimes almost 2,000 years ago, maybe not that, but 1,800 years ago. So there we have things like jhanas and samadhi are translated as stillness. Remember this, uh, oh, Jun Pan, that's right, she was a professor at Stanford of economics. But uh, she was, what's was MIT? That was Stanford. <coughs> and she was, uh, came and stayed for a retreat and she said, yeah, of course, it means stillness. In the Chinese arguments, that's how they understand it. So anyway, right stillness. And this is beginning, this is the uh, Arya Pariyasana Sutta. It's a little biography of the, uh, the Buddha. The Buddha speaking, I remember the time when my father was occupied, while I was sitting in the cool shade of a rose apple tree, having passed beyond the five senses and free from unwholesome states. I entered and abided in the first jhana. I, th I thought, could that be the path to enlightenment, Bodhi? Then the realization arose, that jhana is indeed the path to enlightenment. So <coughs> that a little passage occurred. Now after a Siddhartha Gautama left home, and six years of trying this and trying that, uh, asceticism, you know, just starving. But somehow or other, the spiritual path, which many people follow, they always think the tougher you are, the quicker you'll get to enlightenment. And they feel that asceticism is the best way to transcend the body, to mortify it. But here was the Buddha was remembering six years after he left home, that there was another way to transcend the body. Because he had uh, spontaneously, not spontaneously I suppose, but uh, without knowing really what he was up to and doing, he was uh, under a rose apple tree, a young boy, father was doing the ploughing ceremony, and he went beyond the five senses, free from unwholesome states, he entered a jhana. He actually transcended the body that way. And so that, <coughs> that recollection, that maybe there's another way to let the body go, <coughs> to transcend it, not by asceticism. And having just come to a dead end in his ascetic practices, then he remembered that occasion as a kid. <coughs> and he entered and he remembered that experience 
And this is the thought came. Could that <coughs> jhana be the path to enlightenment? Bodhi, awakening, the, reali the realization of us. That jhana is indeed the path to enlightenment. You can check that out for yourself if you want to check the translation. But you can't really argue with it. So, people who say that jhana makes you stuck, it's the path to enlightenment awakening. And anyone who's experienced a jhana just knows just how powerful it is and just how you, <coughs> you get this incredible data, <laughs> like the tadpole and the frog, similes. You know, you only know what a thing really is when it's not there. When it's here, you can't really perceive it. You don't really appreciate it, you don't know it. But once it's gone, oof, then you understand what it is. Or rather what it was. So that this is one of the reasons why the Buddha realized the jhanas are important. Now, the definition of these jhanas, the four jhanas, having abandoned the five hindrances, totally free from the five senses, free from unwholesome states, he went upon and abide in the first jhana, wherein the mind moves on to the object and holds on to it, the object being joy and pleasure caused by being totally free from the five senses. It's called we wake a bliss. We wake means just seclusion. Not just bodily seclusion, kaya we wake In one sense you can say you're practicing bodily seclusion here, away from the world away from TVs, away from much business. Obviously, if you go on a really secluded retreat, then you can even be further away, like a little hermit. That is also kaya, viveka, seclusion. But even though your mind, body may be secluded, better to get the mind secluded as well. Away, away from what? <coughs> and especially away from uh, the five senses. The word for that is awiwichehi kamehi. Kamehi, K long A M E H I. And the reason I have to spell that out is nothing to do with karma. It's nothing to do with you know, the action and the law of karma. This is another word which, if you pronounce it and you're not listening carefully, sometimes people get confused. And the word karma is not karma sukha not the pleasures of the five senses, it's the five senses itself. The five sense world. Uh, in Buddhism that we always have the, the three worlds. I met a little bit earlier about you know, the worlds, beginning of the world, the end of the world, but to be more specific, more accurate, the Buddha always called the three worlds, the Tiloka. And those three worlds are the world of the five senses, the five sense world, bodies, and that is a world where you do have um, hell realms, ghost realms, animal realms, human realms, and many deva realms, up to even the Brahma realm. And the Brahma realm, God realm, is just in between the, what they call the Rupa Loka and the Harupa Loka. The Rupa Loka is, you have the mind-made bodies, and the Harupa Loka, and it's based on the jhanas, and in the Arupa Loka, the immaterial bodies. So these are realms which are made up of mind stuff. So, <coughs> there's much more than just physical reality, the world of stuff. There's a world of mind as well. So anyway, that these are the three realms, and in particular, this means being free from those five senses, and with it the body. We will say he can make it. And that's what really distinguishes the first jhana. The body is gone. And it's similar to actually the people who, again I've mentioned, who have <coughs> death experiences out of the body, free from this really heavy burden of a body, and don't want to come back again. It's just an understanding this body is a great burden, it's heavy, it's irritating. 
if you want to have a quick uh, proof of how irritating this body is, I just have a look at the people in this room and see what they're doing. Coughing, scratching, just adjusting the hands, adjusting your chin, uh, scratching your nose, uh, just moving your head to the left. Uh, <coughs> Can we really stay still? We can't stay still because this body is always demanding our attention. You know, putting your head, warming your shoulders, adjusting your piece of paper, uh, turning your head, uh, scratching your nose, putting it, your hand down again, just adjusting your feet, your legs, uh, scratching your, uh, your mouth. Now, maybe a bit sort of, um, you know what I'm up to now, so you're perfectly still. <laughs> <laughs> Scratching your ear. But if you actually look at just how people can't remain still, that actually shows <laughs> just how demanding this body is. But we've become used to that, so used to it, we don't notice it anymore. But if you actually look for it, when you're meditating or when you're in a, say in a, a concert or something and people are just sitting there, it's very difficult for them to stay still. They're always doing something. I'll just sit. <laughs> Repeating. <Just laughs> I do it the same. But, that's how a burden the body actually is. And the only time you can really sit perfectly still is when you're in deep meditation. I remember just this one mic, we actually took a video of him when he was sitting deep in meditation. And then placed it, placed it on fast, forward. So increase the speed. Because when you actually increase the speed of something, you can actually see movements very easily. And it's very impressive, this mic, if it was on slow speed, fast speed, it was the same. It wasn't moving. So anyway, that's um, the free from the five <laughs> senses. And that's an important thing to know. Because that's a, one of the very clear descriptions of this, the jhanas. You can't hear. You can't see. You can't smell, taste, or feel, feel physical touch. If someone tapped you on the shoulder, you wouldn't feel it. So that's just the nature of those things. I know that people, they really, now they, the jhana requirement is just out there. People really want jhana so much. They say, well, it, it was a sound, but I, I wasn't really paying attention to it. <coughs> it was a sound, it's not the jhanas. And also they have the free from the five senses, the body is gone, and, and the mind moves on to the object and holds on to it, the object being the piti sukha caused by totally being free of the five senses. So what is going on there? The uh, description which I gave to it was like the wobble of the first jhana. What actually happens there, you are free from the five senses, you're blissed out, really amazing, just wow. The heavy body, the irritation, the cough, the sneezing, the aches and the pains in your tummy, all of that is gone. Totally free of the irritating five sense body. So you have this beautiful bliss. But <coughs> when you have that beautiful bliss, it counts as a jhana because you haven't got the five senses to disturb you. But, there's a sense there of holding on to the bliss. You're grasping it, you don't want it to go. It is like a fear of it disappearing. And, because of that, because you're holding on to it, it becomes slightly unstable. So holding on to it, if those Pali scholars here, call vichara. And as soon as you move slightly away from the bliss, so this is way too strong, you can't sort of abandon it, you get pulled in again. That's the vitaka. 
It never means thought or discrimination. In other contexts it can. But words have different meaning in their contexts. And so it means that you have bliss, slight wobble. When you do get into these jhanas, it's not just for one or two minutes. Sometimes, I correct myself there, sometimes you can have what I call ping pong jhanas. <laughs> you know, you go in, but you know, you're not used to this and just straight away you come out. Call it a jhana, don't call it a jhana, but it's not really a jhana because it's not lasting. It's not stable, it's really unstable. But when I say the Ritaka Vichara, that's something of a totally different level. You're inside, five senses can't get you, and at the same time, you are very, very still by this, <coughs> a little bit of a wobble. Now what happens then is, I'll just go a bit further uh, by my commentary. After a while, they get what you call like confidence, trust in that object of bliss. You know, it's really powerful. It's not, you're not seeing it anymore, you're not visualizing it. It's just bliss. And it's not interpreted as a, as a, uh, uh, a image. The nimittas have gone. It's just the bliss which is left without anything being blissful. That's why I developed that simile of the Cheshire cat. Seeing a, a cat smiling. So I've often seen a cat not smiling, but I've never seen a smile without a cat. This is the bliss without anything being blissful. <coughs> so you're going into some interesting stuff here, totally pleasant, no fear, nothing which is really going to harm or hurt you here. This is great stuff. So you're really uh, merged into this bliss. It may be a bit wobbly, but then after a while you get confidence, totally let go, really let go now. And because you let go, I'm oh, sorry, no, before you let go, you lessen your clinging on to that bliss. You, ha you can let go, it's no, no fear, it's going to stay there, so you lessen, it's just like when you have something valuable, you keep uh, holding on to it. And then you get such trust in the object of bliss, you don't have to, to hold on, so that you don't move off the bliss. Vichara, sorry, the Vitaka, going back onto it, it's not required anymore, but it's still a slight holding on. Uh, to me, I would put that state under the second jhana. However, that Venal Sariputta, he put that as an in-between first and second jhana, because the <coughs> Vitaka is gone, you don't move away from the object, but you're still holding it. And then lastly, they have enough confidence, you can totally let go, and that means that you don't hold on to anything, and that becomes a second jhana object. Uh, and anyway, if you read, sometimes it's good to read, or compare this to other traditions who you know, could have got these jhanas, like uh, again, a St. John of the Cross to Vila, Teresa of Avila, or some of the, the Hindu yogis, and we all mentioned that the five senses are totally gone. We go to deep stillness. So, uh, in the first jhana, continuing on from the suttas, in the first jhana five things are absent and five factors are present. When one has entered the first jhana, the five hindrances are totally absent. You know, the wanting, the ill will, or negativity you'd call it, to make it more refined. The Soth and torpor, you're energized now. Restlessness, <coughs> you're still. No remorse. And lastly, doubt. Gone. So in the jhana, there's no doubt. You're in a very deep state. You're not hallucinating, you're not fantasizing. The doubt is gone. So you're clear. So, uh, five units are totally absent. What is present? The mind moves on to the object, holds on to it, the object being joy and pleasure, and there is a oneness of mind. Oneness of mind, not just in space, 
but in time. In other words, the continuity of experience, singleness of perception. Uh, when the mind no longer moves on to the object, of course it lets go of holding on to it, you enter upon the bride in a second jhana, which has trust in the object. <coughs> the object, the bliss, you'd have to let go of holding on to it. And unity of mind without any movement or holding, with joy and pleasure caused by absolute stillness. That's called the samadhi jhana, the bliss of stillness, where nothing moves. And the reason why is because you can let go. I often notice the times when I have got into a shopping centre, I used to get my airline tickets in the shopping centre in Australia, where you go in there and you see sometimes uh, babies being held by their mothers, fast asleep. And they're just with busy traffic of people, you know, hustling and sometimes bumping into mum. But that baby goes totally asleep because it trusts its mum implicitly that she will not drop it. If you were strong enough to hold me in a shopping centre, <laughs> I would not trust you. <laughs> I would be so anxious that you'd drop me. I could not go to sleep. But you can see, it's amazing to see those babies. They trust their mother so much, so implicitly, they can totally let go and have no fear. Even more interestingly, there was something which I always wondered, but when I was talking about meditation, especially the jhanas and letting go of stability, that somebody gave this great simile of the birds roosting at night time in the trees. It's a windy afternoon, a windy night. If you go outside and see those trees sway backwards and forwards, I'm not quite sure now, maybe the birds are, are hibernating here, but over in places like Australia, they, they don't hibernate, they sleep at night time up in the trees. And I wondered why those birds never fell off the trees. How could they have a good night's sleep without falling off? And again, if that was me, even sitting on there, swaying backwards and forwards, I couldn't go to sleep, I'd fall off for sure. Until somebody once told me, an ornithologist, the interesting thing about birds is that when they roost on a tree, they put their, their claws onto the tree. And the more they relax, the more they let go, the more their claws close into the wood of the tree. More relaxed, more closed, more stable. So if a bird wants to uh, roost on a tree and never fall off. It has to relax to the max. Only then do its claws close up. And in the morning, <coughs> to actually to fly off, that takes effort. That takes striving to move. But to relax, to be still, takes letting go. Full relaxation is the safest most stable position for a bird on a tree. So all the anxious ones, all the ones who have a chronic anxiety disorder, they fell off a long time ago. They're taken out of the Darwinian evolution. So I like that, it's letting go becomes the most stable. So you really let go and then everything is just so wonderful and peaceful. <coughs> that becomes the second jhana. And I always mention the best way to know whether it's the first jhana is to understand the second jhana. Because absolute stillness is, is, is unmistakable. Nothing moves. Nothing. Just a rock, diamond. No shaking at all. That's wonderful. And of course, because there's nothing moving, Huge joy and pleasure caused by no movement, energy, <coughs> all into none, blissing, blissing and blissing. But then, the bliss. You know, if you <coughs> ever go hiking in mountains, 
you get to a peak and you think, wow, I'm on top now. And then you find a little bit further, there's another peak higher. You go to another peak which is higher, that's like the jhanas. The person who gets into the first jhana, if they don't know too much about the Dhamma, they think, wow, this is union with God, this is the, you can't get higher than this. It's amazing. And then, there's another jhana beyond, which is even more refined, even more beautiful. It's not you think like that at the time, you come out afterwards and think, wow, that's it. That's why it's many people, if they don't know the Dharma, they think, if they get a first jhana, they think they're enlightened, they think that's it. Can't be more than that, there is. <coughs> yeah, sure. Hmm. Not really, because children come into this world with some fear, with an identity crisis, finding out who they are in this world. And you can see that it's very hard to see children who are actually still are not asleep. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously there are some children who have done things in their past lives for the first, usually six or seven years of their life, when their previous life can actually affect this life, some of them do weird things. That's why I think it's probably, I think, was, was there any age when the Buddha did it? Was six or seven or something? But anyway, I'd imagine that's about <coughs> the time when he would have uh, sort of sat under the tree and just got into that deep state. It's still connect. Yeah. Ah, that usually refers again to the five hindrances. The five hindrances. The akusale human, the <coughs> unskillful, unhelpful stuff. That's usually the five hindrances. Wanting, not wanting, uh, restlessness and remorse. Uh, Sultan Torpa and Tao. We reach Ahi Kamehi, we reach Akusalehi Damehi. So, anyway, that's the uh, second jhana. Third jhana, with the fading away of joy, you abide mindful and fully aware. You experience the bliss purified from joy. There's many different levels of happiness and you're refining them. You enter upon and abide in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce, one has a pleasant abiding indeed, who has such mindfulness and equanimity. And, uh, this is not something you do, the process, just like opening the, the lotus, going deeper into it, whenever these things which are still, which aren't moving, they disappear. When I was still watching that wall at Throssel Hole, just not knowing what I'm supposed to be doing, it really helps sometimes to not have too much information, too much knowledge, because <laughs> you start to think about things. So if I had been told what to expect, I'd probably be saying, when's that wall going to disappear? I want the wall to disappear. Come on, they told me the wall is going to disappear. <coughs> like I tell you too much about giants. <laughs> Sorry. But, just sitting there, and because my mind was reasonably still, not thinking, in the moment, uh, with my eyes open, a wall vanished. Anything which is still, which doesn't move, turns off. It happens on your computer. If you don't press the mouse or do something, you go to the default and the computer stops. That's like your, everything in this, this mind. So in the first, that you are, you got the bliss, but then it sort of starts moving. And so you just got the stillness with the bliss. And because you got this bliss which is not moving at all in the second jhana, if things don't move, something's going to disappear. It takes a while sometimes, but something's going to go. Because stillness, after a while, something turns off. And what turns off is the course of parts called joy. I'm 
it's much more than that because you can't enter the third jhana just going from nothing to the third jhana. One, two, three, you go into the lotus layer by layer. So that is <coughs> why you go to the second jhana, that's so clear. It's absolutely stillness. And when that stillness, incredibly powerful, when that starts to vanish, then it's another level of joy. And what is important here, one of the reasons why this is said, is because one has a pleasant abiding, this is pleasure, who has such mindfulness and equanimity, the mindfulness is still there, huge. Sometimes people say, oh you're just dulling out, you're not aware at all. Quite the opposite, the mindfulness is about to reach its peak, the strongest, most powerful mindfulness you can ever have in the fourth jhana. But in the third jhana, you still have a bit of ple pleasure, the sukha, and you have <coughs> mindfulness and equanimity. This is why it can only refer the highest mindfulness and equanimity, which is pleasurable, is the third jhana. Beyond that, the pleasure disappears. It's the next thing which vanishes, because it's not moving. Having abandoned, this is almost like a summing up. Pleasure and pain, this is all experienced from the five senses. And the disappearance of joy and unhappiness, all experience of the six <coughs> sense, the mind, except for equanimity. You enter upon the mind in the fourth jhana, which is only neutral mental vagina, this equanimity, but with pure mindfulness, with equanimity. Now sometimes people say that must be pretty boring. <laughs> but of course then later on the Buddha and Sariputta start to explain <coughs> really different understandings of happiness. Joy and pleasure have disappeared, but that's even more happiness, a more refined type of happiness. Is there anybody here who did like pure mathematics at university? Great. You know like the infinities. I always thought infinity was the highest number you could ever have. And that's what infinity means. But then, you find out there was number infinitely bigger than infinity. And if I remember correctly, that alpha null was infinity, alpha one was infinitely bigger than infinity, alpha two infinitely bigger than infinity, that is bigger than infinity. It just goes on and on. At first it doesn't make any sense. How can you have a number bigger than infinity? But it's easy to prove. Now things like the the uh, irrational numbers, uh, so rational numbers, irrational numbers, and other things which are bigger than the uh, the number of irrational numbers are infinitely bigger than the number of uh, rational numbers, which are infinite anyway. So it, it sort of boggles the mind. It's just the fact that our mind is very limited, and it's it's what it can perceive and understand. And sometimes you have to allow the mind, or even the brain see things which at first seem impossible but actually uh, exist. So anyway... <coughs> yeah? Yeah? Yes? Of bliss. So what you have in say, the first child... Sorry? No, it's, it's of the, uh, the sixth consciousness in its, uh, the bliss, it's all, um, uh, five senses gone, the sixth sense, very purified and strong, and is a mindfulness within there, the jhanas you cannot explore. I mentioned this, you can't, the simile of, if I put an object up, I end on, what is this? You know, it, to me it's a circle. Because, you know, to understand what this is, I've got to turn it this way, turn it that way. You've got to move things to 
to understand them. But when something is really still, you're perfectly aware, but you can't really comprehend it. You can't examine it this way and that way and compare it to other things which you've experienced in life. It is a singleness of perception. So what happens is, it is true that in a jhana you cannot think, you cannot form conceptions, you're perfectly mindful, different type of mindfulness, but you really are aware. Which means that afterwards when you come out, you use this, you know, the word which they use, pacha awakening jhana, a reflective um, wisdom. You take the objects of the jhana which, you know, ah, oh, I don't know if there's another word for this, but like traumatic. You know, if you have a, an accident, if you are afraid for your life, if you have a very strong negative uh, uh, experience, such as war or something, then you have flashbacks. You can't stop them because they leave an indelible impression on your mind. It's a very strong mental impression. And that's like the jhanas. They're very, very strong. So, you know, when you come out afterwards, what was that? And ooh, you don't need to, so they're not dull, you're not sort of hard to recollect. Especially because just afterwards anyway, the five interests are gone, you've just really got a strong mind. You look at those things, it's very easy. It's after you come out of the jhanas, that's when you can take them and move them around and say, what was there, what was missing? And you sort of ask yourself, you say, could I hear anything? <coughs> no, was I really aware? Was, what was I aware of? What was my mind object? And that's when you say the only answer is bliss, ecstasy. A Christian would say union with God. This, the uh, pure love, that, all that sort of stuff. <coughs> so you only can really give names to it when you come out. So, <coughs> but you are totally mindful, really strongly mindful, but with not being able to move. So you come out afterwards and ask, what are you aware of? And so, <coughs> real bliss. And then you ask, what type of bliss? Like what flavour? Was it moving? Really still. Was that was the second channel or third or fourth? Now, let's get a bit deeper. Now what was happening? So, <laughs> these little things which you can recall very easily, only afterwards you can find out which journey you're in. It doesn't really matter that much which shine you're in, it's just good stuff. You've got no control over them once you're inside. Once you're inside, it's just, you can't move. So, you can't give yourself instructions. Trying to find similes, I once said, it's like having these um, <coughs> series of rooms, one inside the other. <coughs> Middle room is um, the fourth jhana. Around that is the third jhana. Encircling that is the second jhana. Encircling that is the first jhana. And you've got the one door. And the floors are just so slippery that you can't actually move your feet inside. You can't get any traction to do anything. So what you do, you run like hell, not the first door, really get your momentum up, and then as soon as you go in the door, Whatever momentum, you can't add to your momentum, you can't slow it down, that's it. Whatever momentum you have when you go for the first door, you know, if you've got lots of letting go of momentum, renunciation of momentum, you know, even non-self momentum, then you can actually, you go through the first, not fast, but it takes time, and then just because of the momentum you have, the, the first jhana just uh, refined, and you stop moving, no, mo no wobble anymore, and the second jhana is there. And because you stay there and it's very peaceful, that that just morphs into the third jhana, simply because the something vanishes. That's the repeating. <coughs> and then, sorry, the, uh, the, then the sukha disappears to go to the fourth. It just happens, it either happens or doesn't happen. You can't make any progress 
in the sense of doing something once you're inside the jhanas. Totally automatic process. Depends on the, the karma, the what you take inside. Uh, what's the longest time you can be in the They always used to say seven days. But I told the story of that Vietnamese monk, eight days. And sometimes, oh, I, I heard that even you know, some Indian yogis, sometimes, what was that one who was actually lowered into a box underground and they had all these gizmos on him? Uh, to make see what was going on while he was underground. And you know, he wasn't breathing, his heart wasn't moving, there was no sort of brain activity. And he actually determined, how long was that? Okay, it's <coughs> a week or a couple of weeks. Sorry? I, I remember it maybe yeah. correctly. Three weeks, yeah. And so after that, so he made a determination before he said, I'll do this for, th for three weeks or whatever. And then afterwards, they were monitoring it, there was no activity, they are a bit concerned, I mean, he died. But you know, that this is what they said, so they uh, waited three weeks, and almost exactly on three weeks, you know, up on the ground, he was underground, that they started seeing the, the heart starting again, and the, the brain and everything starting moving again. And he brought him up and he was fine. So, you know, this is what happens in the channels. Are you in ecstasy when you come up? Oh yeah, pretty much. In ecstasy before, you have the afterglow. And that will last for four hours? Oh, that can last for a long time. <coughs> just, uh, uh, what are you calling it? Just walking on air. No one can upset you. That's one of the reasons as why. You know, sometimes you test people, they said, I've just got into a, a jhana. And then I say, you got into a jhana, you can't get into a jhana, lay people can't get into jhanas, you know, you're just the uh, English, English people can't go into jhanas. <laughs> and I do that, and what's your reaction? I'm only teasing you, testing you. And if you react, so obviously it wasn't a jhana. If you say, oh, it just doesn't matter, who cares? I'm so peaceful, happy anyway. Then you know it was <coughs> good chance it was a jhana. It's sometimes trying to upset people. It's you know, not a nice thing to do. But you do that, just <coughs> what was it? This story, this was an enlightenment story, it's a very nice little story of this uh, monk in China who said, My meditation is going really, really well. But, you know, living in a monastery or a temple and doing all these duties, it's a bit of a disturbance. I really want to go for it. He said, so just not far from this monastery, there is this island in the middle of a lake, uninhabited. So what I would ask, I, you know, I, I can make a little hut in the middle of the island, but I would ask you know, if I can stay there until I become fully enlightened. And all I would ask is, you know, you arrange the main monastery to send an attendant <laughs> over once a week in a rowboat. I won't speak, I'll keep noble silence, but I'll just write a list of what I need, just basic requirements, you know, to, to keep going, some rice, some lentils or whatever, I won't need much. <coughs> and the other said, okay, it's a reasonable request. So the monk went over to the island, built himself a hut, and he lived very simply. And once a week, the attendant would go, come over with the supplies, and he'd write a little list of the supplies he needed the next week. And after meditating like that in perfect seclusion, he couldn't sort of get a better situation. He decided he'd cracked it, that he was a fully enlightened being. So now what should he do? So he wrote a little note to the attendant, next week please send over some parchment, some ink, and a calligraphy pen. He wanted to write a poem. So the week afterwards, those supplies came. And then he meditated and meditated until he was really peaceful. His mind was still, and then he wrote the poem in his perfect calligraphy. The diligent monk, alone for three years, 
is no longer moved by the four worldly winds. And not being moved by the four winds is just a, a, a way, an idiom for saying you're fully enlightened. Nothing moves you anymore. And he wrote that into such perfect calligraphy that it really deserved to be sort of in some museum somewhere. Because when you've got really strong samadhi just coming out of jhana, just everything just flows. It's gorgeous, it's beautiful. <coughs> There's no ego left in there, so it's just absolutely gorgeous calligraphy. And then he let it dry, waiting for the attendant to come and then gave it to the attendant with the instructions, hand it to the abbot. You know, so that he knew that now he was enlightened. Now he could do some duties to help others, you know, be a teacher, lead retreats, stuff like that. And so when another week went past and the attendant came back with a reply from the abbot. And he really opened his, the reply was actually on his own scroll which he'd written the, the week before. And he wondered what the abbot was, was going to do. And when he opened up the scroll, his face went red because on the first line, the diligent monk, the abbot had written, just in really rough script, F-A-R-T, <laughs> fart. And on the second line, uh, alone for three years, he wrote this time in capital letters, F-A-R-T. <laughs> and the third line is no longer moved, F-A-R-T, underlined. And the last one, by the four worldly winds, really big F-A-R-T, underlined three times with three exclamation marks. And that really upset this monk, who said, that stupid abbot, he's ruined his calligraphy, and this is the sort of stuff which should be in museums. You know, the, the expression of someone's highest attainment, of full enlightenment. And this abbot doesn't know enlightenment when it's in front of his fat nose. <laughs> so he ran and managed to catch the attendant before he was too far offshore. Come back! And the attendant didn't know what to do, so he came back and said, take me to the abbot, now! And so he took him to the abbot, and the young monk stormed into the abbot's office, slammed the calligraphy on the, the abbot's table, explain! And the abbot stood up calmly, unlike this other monk, and read out the poem. The diligent monk, alone for three years, is no longer moved by the four worldly winds. <laughs> and they looked up at the monk and said, Yet, monk, four little farts <laughs> have blown you clean over the lake. <laughs> And then the monk went, oh God, I'm not enlightened. <laughs> and he went over to the lake to meditate some more. <laughs> and that's in, I think, some poem, one of some of his stuff. <laughs> and so that's actually just, if you come, I, sh I shouldn't do this to you, warn you. Because if you come up to a good monk or nun and say, I'm enlightened, <laughs> we'll abuse you. Are you a woman? No, women can't get enlightened in these days. <laughs> <laughs> what? You can't say that. Okay, you're not enlightened. Of course, we can get enlightened. Everyone can get enlightened, but you know, sometimes you've got to stir people up a bit. See if they can be stirred up. Yeah. It's, I think that's a bit too rough. Just to let go. Just to, you don't need to get into jhanas, just be peaceful. Because if they resolve for something, they're expecting it. When they don't expect it, that's when it comes. But what you do do is, uh, after you've had a couple of experiences of jhanas, then the teacher can say, give yourself a time limit. I'll get in there for an hour or two hours or something because sometimes you have to come out for lunch or something. And, if anybody 
does get into a jhana, especially if it's a, one of the deep ones for a long time, eight days, suppose you managed to fruk a jhana like that and you got in there for two or three days. What will he do with you? Because, you know, we've only hired this place for another day. <laughs> But, and sometimes if we leave you here, sometimes the, the management here, they don't know what's going on, they look at you, you're not breathing, and you, you know, no pulse, they may take you to Norwich crematorium. <laughs> so what's the difference? And this is a wonderful thing to know. It's said even in the suttas, in uh, the Chura Vedala Sutta, or Maha Vedala, sometimes I get those too long, they say the difference between someone in the deepest meditation and someone who's dead is your body is warm. If it's cold, it means you're dead. But if it's warm, it means you're in the deep meditations. And that fellow Greg I mentioned the other day, I forgot to mention that, that's what the doctor, one of the other things which uh, made the, the doctor on duty on a Sunday afternoon not send Greg to the morgue straight away. His body was warm, which is weird. There was no um, heartbeat, there was no brain activity. He'd been in that state for a while, but his body was still warm. So that is how you can test. You know, if uh, uh, Venerable Chanda is sitting there at the end of this retreat and she's not moving, not responding, don't think that the cold and the cough has killed her. Just you know, check her body temperature, and if it's still warm, it's just jhana, so leave her alone. And anyway, you can just put her in the back of the car, put her in the boot. <laughs> <laughs> She'll be quite comfortable there. And when you get back to wherever you're going, then just take her out, put her in the room, and when she comes out, I thought, well, oh, I was in Belsey Bridge. <laughs> now I'm in wherever you're going next. And don't mind, you're just having one lovely time. No problem. Yeah, go on. When um, his wife, Greg's wife, found him, was he sitting? Yeah, sitting exactly as he was before I had moved. So that's. Yeah? Oh, that's right, yeah. Yeah. That's a good story. Because when Ajahn Chah had his stroke, he couldn't speak. And some people were wondering what the heck's going on inside, in his mind. But every now and again, sort of, that uh, he would stop breathing. And they had a doctor on duty. Uh, no, no, well, not a doctor, sorry, it was a, 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 a medic, a male medic, paid for by the then King of Thailand making sure that he got the best care and two monks, at least two, attending on him. And one night, it happened quite regularly apparently, one night Ajahn Chah stopped breathing and the medic on duty, I think they tested his, his, uh, his heart and that didn't seem to be working either and he got paranoid, he got scared. He knew, as I put it, he knew Ajahn Chah would die one day but when you're paid for by the King of Thailand, he didn't want Ajahn Chah to die on his shift. <laughs> In case you, know, you get blamed for something. If you get a famous person, a celebrity, you're supposed to be looking after them. You know, oh crikey, and if he dies, I'll get sued. Or something will go wrong. So anyway, that he wanted to intervene. And that's when the monk said, no, he's just in a deep meditation. And of course, this is the first time the medic had seen this. So he's still scared. So they came to this wonderful compromise. They took blood samples every, uh, I don't know, 10 minutes or 15 minutes to make sure the blood was oxygenated. And somehow or other, the oxygen level in the blood remained fine, even though there was no breathing. So as long as there's oxygen in the blood, I don't know how the heck it gets there mm -hmm. and how it doesn't get depleted, but it's oxygen in the blood, which meant the brain would be damaged and other stuff would be fine. I know sometimes, I think, I think in some commentaries they say it comes through the pores. I don't know if that's even possible, but who cares how it happens? He was still not breathing, 
they had plenty of oxygen. Obviously, it wasn't using hardly any. They still had enough oxygen. So, weird stuff. I don't mind saying, I'll say this as well. There was a, uh, one of, last time I was in Sri Lanka for a conference, one of the uh, followers sort of said, oh, can I come and see you in your hotel room? And it's about a dozen, 15 people came in, him and his followers as well. I don't know if that was allowed inside a hotel room, but it's about 20 people in the hotel room. I'm glad that sort of the, they was in Sri Lanka and they sort of didn't think we were having a party in there or something. But anyway, that um, he was telling me of uh, one of his, the followers there had a very, very good samadhi and you know, could get into jhanas quite easily. And the, the leader of this group was a doctor. So it was actually, you know, with this, uh, his, uh, this follower's advice, of uh, consent, did some experiments on him while he was in Samadhi. And he said, you know, how actually vulnerable are you when you're in Samadhi? So, you know, he, he went this fellow was in Samadhi, because he was a doctor, he took out a scalpel and tried to cut his arm. And he said, the knife will not penetrate. Couldn't get in. And he was a doctor, he knew what he was doing. He had sort of the, just to stitch him up afterwards and um, uh, to uh, make sure there's no infections, disinfectant first of all. But tried, tried, using some force, and a, a fresh scalpel could not penetrate his skin. And it actually filmed it. He told me he was going to send me the film, but I haven't got it yet. But anyway, the, then next time, he uh, asked this gentleman, said, when you get into deep meditation, can I have permission this time to cut your skin? He said, yes, of course. Because now he trusted the doctor. So he went into the deep meditation, and this time the, the knife penetrated. So he made quite a deep incision, no anaesthetic, and then sort of made sure it was, uh, it was uh, sterile, and then sewed it up again and put a, a um, bandage on it, whatever. And of course, throughout the whole time, you know, what all was going on, and no pain, no screaming, because it was deep meditation, just to prove to himself and make a video of it, so these things actually do happen. But the interesting part of that was not just there was no pain at all, because you drop your five senses. What was interesting was the first time he tried to cut the, uh, his <coughs> the disciple's arm, the scalpel wouldn't go through. Couldn't penetrate. He had to get permission first of all. Yeah, before it went into the jhanas, and then it could do it. Weird stuff. Okay, so please remember, <coughs> if you do get into a jhana, just don't give anyone permission to cut your head off, <laughs> and then you're fine. Sorry? How many cat scans? How many cat scans? How many? Uh, there's very few have been done, uh, but I do remember <laughs> a Tibetan monk a long time ago. He was told off, and he wasn't going into the hospital to get CT scans done. He was going because he had some sort of uh, little problem. And when they brought these CT scans on him, then he started messing around with them, making them do weird stuff. <laughs> so the hospital staff said, please stop messing around because, you know, we don't know what to do. What was that other case? There was, uh, who was that? That's why there was, I see a Thai monk in Queensland, I think. Ajahn Sujata was telling me about him. <coughs> it was just, he went, oh, that's right, there was, <laughs> he was an interesting monk. So he went to, uh, uh, just one of these little monks you wouldn't know was a great meditator or something. They were living sort of somewhere in Queensland, <coughs> and that uh, one of his disciples sort of was in the ICU, had so many gizmos attached to him, and he went in there, and the fellow was just uh, almost dying, and so this monk sort of gave him a really powerful blessing, and he fried all of the, the monitors, mm -hmm. fried them, 
they were didn't work anymore. For the guy survived. The, the fellow just had a, a miraculous recovery. And so the doctor in this uh, unit said, please, well done that you kept this guy alive. But next time you come, please let me know and I'll take all of these expensive equipment out <laughs> before you get in there because you're frying them all. It's nice when you see weird stuff. One of the other weird stuff. Okay, weird stuff again. Forget the jar and stuff. People like the weird stuff. For the weird stuff, there was this monk. Um, so many of you know Ajahn Pasano. You know, I grew up with him. He's over in San Francisco now. This monk, he was coming to, uh, to visit. Um, so Ajahn Pasano was waiting for him at the arrivals lounge in San Francisco airport. And when this monk came out, of the arrivals lounge, having passed through the customs immigration, the Ajahn um, Pasno, his, they call it the yarn, the monk's bag, the monk's bag. You know, you see these little things which I carry around, you got one there? No, it's up in the room. They had lots of zips on them, and one of the zips was stuck. And this monk said, well, oh, I can fix that for you. And he, he just comes through Homeland Security. Real big tests, x-rays, goodness knows what else. And he opened up his, his robe, and in his jacket inside had all these pockets. And in these pockets there were screwdrivers, <laughs> pliers, about three or four knives. <laughs> he had a whole tool chest carried around him. It's really weird that you know, he carries it everywhere. You know, you ask him, what do you do that for? He said, it's some sort of karma, I have to do this. But anyway, he has a whole tool chest which he carries with him on board all aircraft and when he goes through the metal detectors he said, how do you do that? And he said, I just do some loving kindness and the thing never goes off, never beeps. <laughs> <laughs> now you think that's a joke but that's real. And there's some weird stuff which goes on. But you don't have to worry because a terrorist can never do that. They haven't got the deep meditation. You have to be sort of very peaceful, powerful, meditated and stuff like that. It's true, that's what he does. And, oh. <laughs> it's not just a knife. It's about four or five knives and screwdrivers, pliers, goodness knows what else. <laughs> ah, well that's an interesting one, whether there's uh, fourth China, no. Because in the fourth jhana, that's, they say there's no even breathing. The mind is still. It's, it's an interesting <coughs> one whether the joy registers as a brain activity. But certainly in the fourth jhana, you're too still. The brain is pretty much stopped there. It may have stopped beforehand. There's no discernible activity there. Blank screen. Certainly, you know, CT scans are obviously much more refined than the old monitors and flat liners. But interesting. No. Yeah. Yeah, but he retires, but he can't retire for too long. Ajahn Sujito retired. But he still comes back. He was teaching at a retreat in, in IMS. So it's only sorry? He teaches a lot, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's not real retirement. It's it's uh, still having to work. As I said, there's no retirement for monks and nuns. The only way out of this is in a box or in jhana. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I didn't get that. Wasting. Awakening. Awakening experiences, yeah. You can always, the amount of opening which is necessary, but usually the really big jhanas. The 
delusion, a sense of self and the identity, the wanting to achieve things, all that spiritual materialism which you have to totally abandon or rather it has to abandon you, this is big stuff. So as one uh, psychologist, you remember, oh, what's his name again, you remember Chris Perrier, um, Diane in Perth, he was a, a psychologist, Chris, and he once put it up very well, he said, <coughs> the delusion, the illusion is just so deeply ingrained for many lifetimes, you need a really big kick up your ass to actually dislodge it. Not a little China, but a big one. To actually to, that's how he put it. To actually to, you know, really make you see something different. Not a gentle tap on the shoulder, but a huge boot up the bum. <laughs> to make it gross. But anyway, just small Chinas are great. Just keep on going. See if it happens. And if it comes to like awakenings, Sometimes, again, I'll try and find similes. I already mentioned that one simile when I really thought I'd cracked it and was fully enlightened. And it's only because, <coughs> because I got angry, I thought, oh, crikey, I'm not. That sometimes it's like when you have awakenings, it's like a huge explosion goes on in your way you look at life. And then you have to wait for the dust to settle to see what edifices, what buildings are still remaining. And sometimes that may take years. Sometimes you really see people think they're alive and then suddenly they feel, oh crikey, I'm not. We have those big explosions and sometimes when the dust settles, there's nothing left. Or you see what is left. So maybe a stream winner, you've still got some more buildings to blow up. This is only a metaphor, more defilements to undermine and then eventually this, these things happen and it all crumbles and fades, nothing left. So that's why it's, even the people already ask me this, how can you tell that a person is enlightened? You can tell that they're not enlightened, that's the easy one. <laughs> but just because you can't see any flaws in their practice or character doesn't mean they're enlightened. It may be like that for years and then suddenly one comes up. You can certainly tell when they're not in mind. Okay, there are... I'll just go quickly through this, but no questions, I'll just finish off. Not much here. <coughs> and what kind of meditation did the Buddha recommend? This is Gopika Mogalana. Totally free from the five senses, you abide in the first jhana. When the mind and the second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana, the Buddha only praises four kinds of meditation, the jhanas. The archunda, these four kinds of life devoted to pleasure that are entirely conducive to repulsion, fading away, cessation, peace, realization, enlightenment, to nibbana. What are they? The four jhanas. So if devotees of other sects should say that the Buddhists are addicted to these four forms of pleasure seeking, you should tell them, yes. And what are these addictions to the four um, uh, pleasure-seeking jhanas? Stream meaning whilst returning, non-returning, fully enlightenment. And this is from six, Majima 64. This is the, uh, what's it called? Uh, Mahamulunki Buddha Sutta. There is one path only one path. Ananda, one way to the abandoning of the five basic fetters, the five lower fetters usually. But you know, I don't call them lower and higher, they're just basic. It is impossible that, it is impossible that anyone can understand or abandon these five basic fetters without relying on that path. No more than it is possible to cut out the hardwood from a tree without cutting through its bark and sapwood. What is that path? The four jhanas and the three material <coughs> payments. And from Majjhima 68, this is a, a Narakapana Sutta. While you still do not experience jhana, and you don't experience it, the five hindrances, together with discontent and weariness, invade your mind and remain. But when you do experience the jhana, the five hindrances, discontent 
and weariness do not invade your mind and remain. So one of the purposes of the jhanas is actually to, to knock out the five hindrances <coughs> and no, <coughs> no discontent. People can sort of call you a pig, but there's no discontent and no weariness, you're energised. That's why if you do get a jhana, if you get a jhana this evening, you won't sleep tonight. You don't want to, what do you want to sleep for? You have just got so much energy and happiness. <coughs> when you, and this is from the Anguttara, uh, when you have no jhana, for one deficient in jhana, the cause for seeing things as they truly are is destroyed. When the cup is not still enough, any reflection is distorted. When you do not see things as they truly are, the yata bhuti jhana dasana, then, uh, for one deficient in such wisdom, the cause for repulsion, moving, al <coughs> moving away from samsara and fading away is destroyed. When you're not repulsed nor inclined to disappearing, for one deficient in these, the cause for knowledge and vision of liberation is destroyed. Develop jhana, when you experience jhana, this is sangyuta, then you can understand things as they really are. And what you understand, as it really is, the origin of passing away of form, the origin of passing away of experience, the, uh, wait enough, the origin of passing away of perception, the origin of passing away of will, sankharas, the origin of passing away of, of consciousnesses. And lastly, Dhamma part of 372, there is no jhana for one without wisdom. You need insight to develop wisdom. There is no wisdom for one without jhana. The jhana supports wisdom. For one who has both jhana and wisdom, they are in the presence of Nibbāna. Nati jhānaṅ apanyasa panya nati ajayato yam hi jhānaṅ ca panya ca jhānaṅ panya sawe nibbāna santike. I was so impressed with that that I just learnt it and will never forget that in part. So I, I go a bit over the top in just saying that how jhana is important because too often it's just saying, I oh, don't need jhanas. The truth of the matter is, you do. <laughs> so And a word on the bear. Somebody donated that bear today, so we've been cuddling it, and uh, they want it to be auctioned for Anukampa later on, and it's got the okay from the World Wildlife Fund <laughs> <laughs> to sell a, sell a bear. So what we're going to do, anyone who likes to have a blessed bear, we have like silent auction. Things called. So you write your bid on a piece of paper, and the last day. We can start now. The highest bid, yeah. But you put it on a piece of paper, so don't let anybody know. Otherwise, someone say, "How much? What's the highest bid so far?" You can put it here. Yeah. Okay. Put it there. And no cheating. No having. <laughs> okay. And then, this bear is not for auction. <laughs> That's the bear the pod. Bear will chanter. A little bear. It's a really nice bear. It's so cute. Sure, I don't want to auction it. No, no. <laughs> See how cute it is. Okay. Okay, so anyway, what are we doing now? We're doing tea time. No, uh, meditation time and then tea. Yeah. There'll be yeah. chocolate tonight as well. Okay, chocolate tonight will work as well. Okay, see you later. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs>